Yeah. 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 I really do not want to be loud right in front of this front row because I am loud by nature. Can you hear me in the back as well? Okay, cool. So if you can hear me through that microphone, you can hear me. I'm really going to struggle with not being loud because I'm just loud. Um, so anyhow, we talked about, uh, we left off kind of here, but like this might be your future, right? Like we might be living in a biodome soon because the world's going to be too, it's just going to be nasty out here because we've got this climate change. So we're going to have to be able to to manipulate the soil that we grow that we build that biodome over. So we'll be looking for good soil to start with because we don't want to put a biodome over bad soil and have to double our work. So to understand the good characteristics of good soil, and then also if we do happen to have it over bad soil, then we can manipulate that and turn it into something that we can actually grow something in. Um, I mentioned these are the kind of the questions that are going to be bothering you that like we're going to have to solve in the next 20 years as we move out of here, right? We've got to figure out how to feed a whole bunch of people. So we have to almost double our agricultural produ productivity with half the resources. And we also need to mitigate this climate change because that's kind of what causes us the problems, right? That's why our world's going to be uninhabitable. Or it's going to be nasty outside. It's not going to be fun to be in. So uh, we left off here with this slide talking about what the definition of soil is. Um, as a uh, agronomist and as someone who teaches soil, I very much dislike that D word. And I know that there are some people who are just kind of grew up calling it dirt. Um, but I would encourage you to try to use soil because it's important for us. It's important to me. Um, it's where we get our crops from. Now what you kick off of your boot before you go into the, into the house, that's dirt. Dirt is misplaced soil. So it's the unconsolidated mineral and organic material. So by unconsolidated, what we mean is it's kind of mixed. It's variable. So it's not just a uh, um, all potassium or um, all dark soil or all clay or all sand. It's just it's a it's a mixture of different types of uh, particles that fell off of minerals. <clears throat> we have some organic material and so soil formed from leaves and trees, uh, insects, rocks breaking down. There are all these processes that went into forming the soil. And it serves as a natural medium for the growth of land plants. Did you have a question? Okay. So it serves as this natural medium for the growth of our land plants. Um, because we will be living in these domes, we might not have as much soil to work with. Um, is anyone here into like vertical farming? Does that interest anyone? Vertical farming a little bit? So that's gonna be kind of something that we may uh, move to because we just don't have the space and vertical farming is a very efficient, effective way of growing lots of crops uh, in a very small, confined space. We got a tablet? That's what's up. The unconsolidated mineral or organic material on the immediate surface of the earth it serves as a natural medium for the growth of land plants. So we have kind of this ideal thought, like if we can have the ideal soil, that will be comprised of about 45% mineral, right? Because it's something we can actually pick up. If anybody's ever made a mud clod, mud ball, like there's, that, there's a mass to it. So we have mineral matter, Here's that organic part. So this is the unconsolidated mineral material. Here's the organic part of it, about 5% organic. And that makes up kind of what we can actually touch. On the other side, we have the pore space. And so has anybody ever dug a hole 
and then went to go put the soil back in the hole and didn't quite fill it up. However, yeah. how come there's not enough in yet? Thank you. He's going to be the guy that answers the question, <laughs> right? So the reason why you it, it doesn't fill it back up is because we messed with this structure. And we adjusted the pore space a little bit. Same amount of material came out of it, but when it went back in, the structure is different. And so now it doesn't quite fill the hole all the way. Everyone good here? If I move too fast, raise your hand, let me know. I don't want to leave anybody behind at all, ever. So, in order to keep up with um, kind of mitigating climate change and um, making sure that we're doing the right thing with our land, some of y'all might have heard of regenerative, regenerative agriculture. Um, there's a big debate between regenerative and sustainability. Um, we're not here to debate that, but I do like some of the principles and the concepts within regenerative agriculture. First off, we need to understand the context of our farm operation. We need to know what we're doing, why we're doing it, and how to go about it. What are some of the best management practices? Am I doing those best management practices? Next, we want to minimize that soil disturbance. No-till, no-till farming, and anybody grow hay, pastures, cattle, y'all till the land. Nope. All right, so we're already kind of doing this, right? In the context of our hay operation, we are not tilling the land. Anybody grow any type of row crop? No one? Okay. Still can't find much corn cotton soil around here. I actually did find some. I went out to, uh, I you, we went out to uh, Cantor Falls. We were driving out to Cookville Boat Dock, and I finally saw fields of corn and soybean. I almost got an accident a couple times because I was too busy looking off the side of the road trying to see why they were discolored and whatnot. Want to maximize that crop diversity because if we increase our biodiversity, if we grow a monoculture, our crops can get wiped out immediately. We have pests and diseases that come in and if we don't diversify that crop, we don't have the natural uh, enemies to uh, defeat those pests we have crop rotation. This is kind of more of the agronomy thing that, that we would discuss maybe in crop production <coughs> systems. But it still goes in here. Cover crops are going to be a big thing. Keeping the cover, keeping the soil covered. And then our hay and pasture systems we don't have that problem, do we? Because we have something on it year round. maintain some sort of living thing on a year round. So if we have a, a fallow cropping system, if we have something where we grow something in the, for a cash crop during the growing season and then leave it fallow without anything on top of it, what happens to the soil? Washes away. It washes away, that's correct, because we don't have anything holding it there, right? We also lose a lot of nutrients because the rain is going to leach some of those nutrients through the soil profile. And then finally, integrating some livestock. This is probably the only part of this regenerative agriculture thing. From an, ag from an agronomist standpoint, I don't know how I'm going to put cows on my corn crop. I haven't figured out how to do that on a thousand acres, right? But this kind of system, this regenerative agriculture, is how we continuously create soil. Here. All right, the slide's got a lot going on with it because soil plays a large role not only in plant life but in also our humans. And I was I was kind of looking at some things this morning um, a few years ago when I was back at Mississippi State. I received like the, the American Society of Agronomy. They sent me a magazine or something or other. And it was saying they were selling bags of soil in Africa people in Africa are eating soil so that they can get their nutrients because they don't have any crops to grow there. So they're stuck with their only means of getting these minerals and nutrients into their body is eating soil. They've become addicted to it. 
I know, right? I'll, I'll post a YouTube video. I was watching it earlier. I just kept going down the YouTube rabbit hole of these, and they're selling these. Y'all know the like clay that you used to get in like uh, grade school that comes in the the big tubes. They're selling those, and I don't know, they had to sell like a thousand of them to make ten dollars a month. So they're out there working the soil and making these little clay bars so that they can sell to someone else for pennies, just so that they can eat and their kids can eat. They're mixing it with water, and that's their only substance. I mean, it looked like it was oatmeal. I mean, just think about a mud slurry, and that's how they have to live. So soil provides all these nutrients. Luckily for us, we can grow crops, and it's the crops that we eat, that the, cat, that the cattle eat, that our animals eat, and that's how we get our nutrition. So that's why I call it soil. I don't call it dirt. It's not dirt to me. Um, it's very difficult for me to say that word. Uh, you'll hear the dean mess with me about it, uh, but man, I would appreciate it if y'all could call the soil while we're here. I had a student call it dirt. The presentation almost fell out of my chair because he had me for soil. So we have two major areas of study in soils. One is the pedology. So this is how the soil formed the morphology of the soil and how we classify that soil. Um, anybody here going to NRCS? Maybe Rachel? NRCS, Pedology, Environmental Agri-Science. Is that you? That's kind of what they study in more geomorphology and geology and things like that. Um, however, for us, we are more interested in the edifology or the influence on the living things and how that influences how our society actually survives. And so souls play a huge role in that in several different in several different ways. primary importance of soils is that it determines the ecosystem and so here we are uh, Africa obviously Africa um, their ecosystem the Saharan Desert not a lot of stuff grows there right Desert. they don't get any rainfall it's mostly sand um, here in uh, South America a lot of rainfall uh, a, a very diverse uh, ecosystem not only from a plant standpoint, but also from like an insect and uh, biodiversity standpoint. We have America up here, we have our own climate and ecosystem, uh, Australia, and then also kind of China and Europe and Russia. But the soils and how they were formed, the actual pedology of those soils dictates how their society lives, because it's pretty rough right here nothing there right it's just it's, it's camels and mirages it influences our food supply not only just from a meat standpoint what we don't think about is that uh, most of the corn and soybean that we grow does not go to feed humans it's actually shipped to concentrated animal feed operations I mean, how much corn do y'all really eat Maybe a maybe a, an ear or two at a barbecue or some something, but like not a whole lot, right? How come we're growing so much corn though? So it is being processed, but primarily it goes to feed our animal populations. But it's also important for our fruits and vegetables, and we need both of these to kind of have a, a healthy kind of diet. Now, I'm not saying one diet is better than the other. If you don't like meat, that's okay. We still got some fruits and vegetables for you. Okay? What I'm saying is, is that if we didn't have soil, we wouldn't have any of this. When we get our cotton and trees, make lumber and paper. So as we start to degrade our soil from soil and water conservation, 
overgrazing deforestation because we need this lumber and this cotton. And it also provides some wool and from sheep because they eat the grass and we get the wool from them. So no soil, no grass, no sheep. Fuels, wood, coal. Coal is really um, our fossil fuels formed from uh, plants, peat, animals that died in a certain specific uh, environment and then have been compressed over time, but it supplies us with some energy. And then also some of our corn is grown for ethanol. So we're growing a lot of corn because we need to feed the animals and we're also trying to create biofuels. Now, almost directly to us, what this soil is important for, it serves as a recycling system. It's going to modify that atmosphere. And we'll go over this in a minute. As we build on it, right? There's buildings, uh, water supply, but primarily we are concerned in agriculture with this medium for plant growth. Remember, the unconsolidated mineral or organic material that grows on the immediate surface of the earth used for growing land plants. As a recycling system, um, it, has an in, it has a big influence on, our, on the hydrologic cycle, our N, P, and K cycles. For those of you who might live in the fertility, that's also with me, um, and some of our nutrients. So all of this cycling happens so that when we eat the plants, we get the nutrients out of it. <coughs> it modifies our atmosphere because it regulates the movement of carbon dioxide, oxygen, and some of the other gases that are given off during these plant processes. So understanding how those nutrient cycles play a role is going to help us understand how to mitigate some of that greenhouse gas emission. So that's kind of, that was one of our things in the beginning, right? We need to figure out how to mitigate some of this climate change, our soil, carbon sequestration, things like that. So how do we get carbon out of the atmosphere? Which plant process pulls carbon <coughs> dioxide out of the atmosphere? Photosynthesis, correct. More plants pull more carbon dioxide, send back oxygen. So we need soil to grow plants. <coughs> that's part of the biosphere. And that's just kind of how plants, animals, humans, insects, um, all of those products and those remains our, uh, are basically recycled. The hydrosphere. It rains, water either goes into the ditch, <laughs> if you remember that, it goes out the end. What we'd like for it to do is to go straight down. But it rains so fast and so quick that we get two inches of rain in an hour we only get this much infiltration because the rest of it's run off, right? So we have this flooding problem. And that's all caused by our climate and our atmosphere and this climate change that we're having. And then finally, it was the lithosphere. And so this is the minerals and the rocks and the clays and all those little particles um, that are slowly but surely breaking down over time just through the natural processes that just occur daily. It's a habitat for the organisms. And so as I mentioned before about the eating the soil um, so that they can get the nutrients, the, habit, the, the organisms that are in the soil were causing them some gastrointestinal problems, as you can imagine. Not only are you eating sand and silt and clay, that might clog up some things, um, but you also have these parasites that are in the soil. And so once those parasites get inside your body, how do you get those out? So you're in Africa, they don't necessarily have the best medical supplies over there. So you have addicted to this thing that's giving you this uh, parasite that's in, that ultimately kills you. So as an engineering medium, uh, they do use, you know, soil is one of the oldest uh, engineering mediums. They build houses out of them, adobes, uh, not like Adobe Photoshop. Uh, or maybe they'll call it modes. Is that what it was? Modes, Adobe, whatever. 
Now the water supply and purification, as I mentioned, this hydrologic cycle, we'll go over this side of the module two. Um, it rains. We would hope that most of the water moves through the soil profile, but it doesn't, it actually moves off. And so um, for those of you who apply fertilizer, do we want to really, I mean, do we want to, do we want a deluge? Do we want it to rain really hard, really fast? No. Nope. What kind of rain do we want? Nice and slow, nice and easy, right? We want it to be consistent. So I would much rather take two inches over three days than two inches in an hour because it moves that water through the soil profile. And as it moves through the soil profile, it actually makes it into our groundwater. Our groundwater is where we get our drinking water. So here we are as a medium for plant growth though, which is pretty much what we're here for and what we'll be discussing not the rest of the class. It's support. Um, anybody seen a tree blown over after too much rain? Yep. I'm from the coast. I'm from the coast of Mississippi, and so we see that a lot. Um, hurricanes come through, flood the soil, tree falls over. So if we don't have any soil, um, the trees need that for support. That's where the roots go out, and they're able to stabilize themselves in the midst of the environment. It supplies air, water, and nutrients. So going back to that pie chart, it supplies the air and the water on the other side of that ideal soil. And then in the mineral part are the nutrients. So there are 18 essential plant nutrients. And there's a little mnemonic that we uh, use to remember those 18 plant essential nutrients. It is C. Hopkins Cafe, managed by my cousin, Mokul Nina. And so you'll need to know these 18 essential nutrients. C. Hopkins Cafe, managed by my cousin, Mokul Me. Okay, so carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, we're gonna get this from the air, right? So we got 79% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and a little bit of carbon dioxide. And so you'll have to name, like, it, like when you go take the quiz, you'll have to write out the full name. So carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, potassium, and nitrogen. This is our N, P, and K from fertilizers. These are our macronutrients. We need these the most, the plants do. Sulfur, calcium, and magnesium. So I'm going to ask you to know the difference between the macronutrients and the micronutrients. Well, look right here. C. Hopkins, cat, we're missing the iron. C. Hopkins, cafe managed. C. Hopkins, calcium and magnesium. Okay? Everything else is going to be micronutrients. We have iron, boron, and manganese. probably the most difficult one to spell, or at least the one that trips the most students up. Molly B. Denim. Molly Denim. And then finally, chlorine, nickel, and sodium. So 
C. Hopkins Cafe, managed by my cousin, Mogul Nina. Everyone good here? All right, something that I didn't get to do um, on, the, on, on Friday, I was kind of going over this um, syllabus, kind of the calendar of what we need to do. I wonder, how many of y'all got the notification this morning? How many of y'all got the email? Should be everyone, right? That's I kind of sent that out as like a test, like this is how that's gonna happen. Um, I want y'all to know we have assignment one due Friday. It's not difficult. Um, if you go into iLearn, is Courtney in here? Courtney? If you go into iLearn, do you find everything you were looking for? Uh, yes. Okay. So if you go into iLearn under assessments, under assignments, that's where the assignment is. It's this PDF. Open the PDF, read the, the little chapters, the first chapter of the book for those of you who. Did anybody buy the book? Well, cool. Um, I'll try and supply you with as much information out of that as possible, right? Because I remember what it was like to be a student and I don't need a hundred dollar book that I'm only gonna get ten dollars back for. Um, so there's a little reading that goes along with it that kind of gives you a broad overview, the soils and whatnot, there's a crossword, and from that crossword you're gonna go into quizzes and it'll be assignment one answers. Enter your answers into the assignment and it'll grade it and it'll be done. It's not a hard assignment. Takes okay, 30 minutes max. Um, most of your quizzes are going to be due on Wednesday at 9, 9 p.m. Um, the exams are probably going to happen in lab. Because man, there's 50, of, there's 53 of y'all in here, and I'm pretty sure that those two sitting back there in the back, like it's just natural human nature to, right? I'm not saying that y'all would be cheating, but it's just it's natural human nature that our eyes wonder when we don't know what we're doing. Just kind of, where is everyone? That's just kind of human nature. And so what we're going to do is we'll split that up. Now you can bring a laptop. It'll be a um, lockdown browser. And then if you don't have a laptop or you don't want to bring one, we'll be in the computer lab. So like the first half of lab, we'll sign up. You'll come for the first 50 minutes, take the exam. Then the second half of the lab will come in, take the exam, and then section two, kind of like that. Um, modules will typically end on the Friday before the exam to give you time to study. Um, and I'll have all of that stuff graded for you so that way that you can study over the next two days. Fall break, no class. We're all trying to get there right now. Um, some exams, Thanksgiving, no class. And then your final is going to be on December 10th. Uh, at 10:30. Now, at some point in time, I think we all know there's a possibility that we might not be here. If that happens, what's up? If that happens, the exam's going to be online. Okay, so I got to get y'all used to how that's going to look. Something else I wanted to bring up: um, anybody that's in uh, interested in environmental conservation. Uh, they're going to have an event over in Prescott Hall, and then we're also going to have a welcome back picnic with some hot dogs and chips and stuff outside on the quad. Uh, it's during dead hour. For those of you, for those of you who have been here, we all know that's not a dead hour, is it? Mm -hmm. That's typically the busiest hour on campus on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So, so it just came across my desk this morning. I thought I'd put those in. All right. So. We talked about that 45% being the minerals, right? So now we have to figure out where we got those minerals from. Minerals are the naturally occurring inorganic substances. So what is one of the primary determining factors on whether a substance is organic or inorganic? Carbon. Carbon. Correct. The presence of carbon, typically how we determine if it's organic or inorganic. So you would not expect to see any carbon in minerals. They have a definite 
and a predictable chemical composition and physical properties. That's how we know that they're minerals. So rock is going to be the material that forms the essential part of the Earth's solid crust. And we have the rock cycle that goes along with that, and we'll go over that in just a moment. But minerals are the stuff that rocks are made of. So remember, it's unconsolidated inorganic material, these rocks are. They're not all the same. They have different chemicals. There might be 43% of one certain mineral and 41% of some certain mineral in the rock right next to it. It's just it all depends. It's variable. We have three types of rock. Now, this is probably going back to some physical science y'all might have taken in high school or whatnot, but it's just kind of the basis of how we get through this. So igneous, sedimentary, and metamorphic. It's going to be our three rocks, our three types of rocks. Some of the different rock forming minerals and how we get what our soils are uh, for those who are, would move into classification uh, i'm not really one much for going oh look amphibial right i'm one much for going look silt loam this gives me an idea about what's going on with my crop <clears throat> or what's going on with my field or what's what some problems may or may not be but this when these minerals break down when, when these minerals break down, they give us that C. Hopkins Cafe managed by mine cousin local Nina. They're contained within there in, certain, in a certain composition. So we have magma, which is the minerals formed and stored beneath the Earth's surface. So this is, that, this is that bubbling stuff that you see, like when they show Lord of the Rings going to the center of the Earth. It's like all the all the stuff that's kind of bubbling around, blowing up, and exploding everywhere. Lava is what comes out of the volcano. So magma's on the inside, lava's on the outside. The things that it influences, are, the things that influence the uh, igneous, metamorphic, sedimentary are going to be temperature, pressure, Time. Temperature, pressure, and time. This ion availability and concentration at some point when that mineral, like as it comes out of the volcano, it will undergo weathering. Whatever the ion availability and concentration is, is how we're going to get the nutrients into our soil, other than applying fertilizer. Uh, this is just kind of a look about some of these um, different uh, minerals types and how they form that as the temperature decreases we just have these different formations in the way that they are like crystal <coughs> structures. I'm not a geologist. I don't expect you to be a, a, a geologist. When I go to the waterfalls I go look a rock and that's about the most of it. We were just at, um, I was just at um, Ruby Falls in Chattanooga. Anybody been to Ruby Falls? And the guy was like, so what are the things called on the ceiling? My girlfriend looked at me and she's like, you're a rock guy. And I'm like, no. <laughs> but they're stalactites and stalagmites. Right? Like, that's about as much as I get into geology. And that's about as much as we're going to get into geology. Hey, look. A rock. Okay? <laughs> when I talked about those... Uh, uh, physical and chem like most of the physical properties, uh, we have different kind of things. Geologists have different things that we can use to determine what type of rock it is. Um, if you've ever held like a piece of talc, um, a talc, you can kind of dig your fingernail into it, like kind of soapy like. Um, sand is difficult, and obviously diamond is the most. That's that's the hardest one you can get, right? It's what scratches glass. So. Geologists use this, not in soils. But if I can understand what type of mineral formed here, I can have a little bit of insight about what type of um, 
nutrients might be available in the soil. So the rock cycle, we have magma. Remember magma is what is in the earth. It comes out of the volcano. It will undergo cooling and crystallization. Right, because it gets exposed to the atmosphere. Inside the earth it is 1,200, 12,000 degrees Kelvin or something, super hot. As it hits the atmosphere, it cools down very rapidly based on kind of the ion availability and the concentration. It will form an igneous rock. So we have extrusive igneous rocks. So as it comes out, these are the ones that form on the outside. And then we have intrusive igneous rocks. And these are formed from the magma that cools inside of the earth. And so as the weather starts to erode some of that upper soil, the crust and whatnot, we get these other rocks that are exposed. So here's our magma, comes out, forms these igneous rocks. They undergo that um, crystal cooling and crystallization. 1250 degrees Celsius is when it freezes. Freezes. I mentioned we have those two, the different types of extrusive and intrusive rocks again. I need to know that we're not geologists. We just need to know that there's a couple of different types and the way that they are uh, dispersed into the environment, kind of how our soil is formed, where we get the mineral portion of our soil from. We have different types of these um, rocks. We have a felsic, and we, we kind of keep it simple. You can pretty much see that we have feldspars and silica. And then we have mafic, which is for magnesium and iron. Next, those igneous rocks undergo weathering and erosion because water is a very powerful force, right? So we get a lot of rainfall, we get a lot of wind, we get some soil formation processes, and that ends up breaking apart that igneous rock. And as we break something apart, it becomes easier to decompose, right? It's, it's, if it's consolidated, it's really tough to break that rock. If you get it broken just a little bit, it'll shatter. So we have this weathering and erosion that causes sediments. Those sediments are then going to undergo a process called lithification. Remember from oh, probably 15 or 20 slides ago, we had the lithosphere. This is where we get those from. Within that lithosphere, what happens is those sediments settle. I mean, we've all seen this, y'all. It's in a lake or a creek or whatnot. Um, those, those, they settle, and then they get compacted because some animal or some car or some back then it was likely an animal, um, steps on it and packs that down. Next we get those little gaps filled in with some other sediments, uh, maybe some, some, some polysaccharides or whatnot, and that ends up kind of cementing those together. So now we have these layers upon layers upon layers that are compacted together and we get like a sheet, and those sheets build up over layers. And then finally, we get that crystallization. And the crystallization is kind of what you see under the microscope. You can start to see the actual structure of those rocks. And people, they study that kind of stuff, right? Over in geology. We call those sedimentary rocks. Soil scientists try and keep it kind of simple. So as I mentioned before, did anybody else need that last part? We're on sedimentary, okay? So as I mentioned, we get sediments that wash over, they get laid down on top of each other, we get some other particles that kind of keep everything together. Pressure will compact those into a cohesive layer. We'll get some cementation that kind of 
make sure that rocket, if it were to move, everything's moving with that, not just like the top part of it, not like erosion or runoff. We, the whole rock moves. And then finally, the crystallization and that structure, that structural organization plays a large role in how that mineral breaks down, how that mineral weathers. 